Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm John Santman, the Dean of the uh, Colorado School of Public Health, and welcome to uh, today's uh, presentation by Dr. Uh, Patrick Remington in the uh, Dean's Speaker Series. I'm delighted to uh, introduce uh, Pat, whom I've known for uh, a long time. I think there's uh, several important features of his career, a career that has uh, spanned uh, working in public health in the applied sector, uh, both at CDC and the Wisconsin Division of uh, Public Health, and then coming uh, into academia at the uh, University of Wisconsin's School of Medicine and Public Health, which was probably added about a decade or more uh, ago, reflecting uh, the, uh, the power of bringing together medicine um, and uh, public health under a single uh, umbrella. Uh, among Pat's uh, many, many contributions, I would uh, highlight his role in founding the uh, RWJ uh, funded county health rankings that have been uh, an important tool, both nationally um, and at the uh, state level. Pat has been uh, an educator, a researcher, uh, a leader both uh, in Wisconsin uh, and nationally with a, a broad scope. He's had the wisdom to become a professor emeritus uh, and uh, using his time wisely to pursue interests like cycling and uh, other things. Uh, I've had the fun of uh, going uh, for a ride with uh, Pat and colleagues uh, in uh, Madison. So delighted to have uh, Pat with us today. His topic could not be more timely COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, uh, public health, and uh, politics. So Pat, thanks for uh, joining us today. Great, uh, thanks John uh, for uh, quote, having me. I, I wish I were there exploring the background of, <clears throat> of uh, the Colorado Rockies. Uh, I had, as you know, intended to come out. I found our email exchange uh, from last February, March, and then April, and we were, sort of uh, slow in canceling. I remember I was pretty committed to come and your last minute email was, you're coming anyways, aren't you? Even if the, the talk has been canceled and I didn't, I, I pretty much have been home and uh, self quarantined since that time. So I hope I can, uh, I, I hope you'll have me back this time in person. Definitely. Let me uh, share my screen and uh, just ask if that is working okay. So uh, I'll put it in presentation mode. So do you see the- uh, yeah, yeah, all good, Pat, all good. Okay, great. So um, yeah, as I remember last spring, I was planning to talk about uh, the transformation of our school and how medicine and public health ha has been integrated, but uh, obviously uh, uh, the pandemic um, intervened and uh, I have been spending a lot of time talking about COVID-19 and uh, what strikes me is this interface between science and, uh, and politics. And, and uh, so I thought uh, I would talk about that. But before I begin uh, with the name of Patrick and uh, uh, an Irish uh, uh, father and grandparents, I, uh, I have to say happy Father's Day, or sorry, happy Pat St. Patrick's Day uh, to, uh, to everyone. And, uh, uh, enjoy, but obviously be safe. This is a, you know, CDC is already worried about COVID related transmission on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, this is the outline of my talk. I'd like to briefly talk about my path to public health. First, oftentimes in seminars, there are learners and people in training. And I think it's always uh, nice to hear about um, the circuitous path often for uh, people to find public health. Uh, and then I'll focus the uh, most of my talk on, on the pandemic. And in particular, I want to uh, look at failures in our response in three areas, political failures, failures of our systems, and cultural failures. And then end with uh, comments about next steps. Uh, so my uh, path to public health actually began in medical school right here in Madison at the University of Wisconsin Medical School at the time. And uh, I was interested in primary care and in global, uh, global health. Uh, but unfortunately, during my fourth year, I had planned to spend the last months of medical school in Zaire on a global health elective. But uh, due to civil unrest, 
uh, that elective was canceled and I had to scramble to find something to do, something really to just get a few extra credits uh, to be able to graduate. And uh, it was almost accidental that I had a friend working at the health department. Uh, I really didn't know what public health was and certainly didn't understand what epidemiology was. And uh, I began that elective on February 1st. And on the second, we got a call about uh, a diagnosis of sporotrichosis. That's a fungal infection of the typically uh, of the hands leads to nodular adenopathy in the arms. And uh, it's rather self-limited, but, but an unusual infection nonetheless. And I uh, was sent out to do the study. And there I, uh, I uh, determined my first relative risk because I noticed that of the seven male workers who regularly made grave sprays. These were decorations that go on gravestones in the winter. Um, four developed sporotrichosis compared to none of 10 who did uh, not uh, produce those grave sprays. Uh, and in fact, then used laboratory to confirm that because we cultured sporotrichium schenkii, uh, the causative agent. And I ended up uh, writing this up, actually submitted it to the CDC as an MMWR. And this is a picture of my mentor at that time, Jeff Davis, who was the uh, state epidemiologist. He has uh, since passed away. And just before leaving uh, town, uh, I had a brief conversation with another mentor, Dennis Mackey. And uh, he heard of my interest in global health and said, if you want to work in global health, then you really need to learn epidemiology. Uh, and then he picked up the phone and called CDC. Uh, I did not know at the time he had been uh, formerly uh, an EIS officer, uh, and he had some strong connections with the, uh, that program. And uh, one thing led to another, and I was... Uh, uh, I applied to, to the Epidemic Intelligence Service, but not before going to Seattle uh, to complete my internship. I started at Children's Hospital at the University of Washington uh, and then did 10 months of internal medicine at Virginia Mason. And really that experience, I think cemented more than anything, more certainly than the elective that I took in medical school, my interest in uh, working upstream and understanding not just the causes of these preventable injuries and illnesses, uh, but what we could do to prevent them. And uh, I pretty much uh, uh, decided that my, my career would move upstream. Uh, and CDC was an amazing place to work. Uh, I, as uh, uh, John mentioned, I was in the Epidemic Intelligence Service uh, uh, I played what Kate Winslet played, an EIS officer in Contagion for two years in the state of Michigan. Uh, and then I went back to CDC to do the preventive medicine residency and then benefit from a career development program. And it was certainly an amazing time uh, in the mid 80s. Uh, during that time, I worked on a number of epidemiologic studies ranging from Rye syndrome, etiology, foodborne outbreaks, airborne measles, uh, transmission, smoking, chronic disease prevention, and work developing a surveillance system for health behaviors. And I'll just mention my work with airborne measles, because to me at the time, it was just a, a sort of a, a, a quick look at an at a outbreak in a doctor's office in Michigan. Uh, but it turns out to have foreshadowed, I think, a lot of work in my career, but also in, in the area of respiratory illnesses. And uh, uh, we had gotten a call from a physician who said it's very unusual. He, he, he saw a patient uh, with measles uh, in the office. He, the, the patient was admitted to the hospital. And then three children who came in after lunch, long after the patient had left, developed measles. And they thought I should come and work it up. Uh, and at the time, uh, airborne transmission of measles had been debated. Uh, for many years, in fact, uh, since the turn of the previous century, um, that uh, it was thought that measles really needed face-to-face -face contact. And this is a bar graph of the time these children were in the pediatrician's office. And you can see from the index case, um, the four subsequent cases, one overlap, but three were there uh, up to two hours later. And in fact, when you looked at where they sat and the rooms they were examined in, uh, some sat in different chairs and were examined in different rooms. And we actually generated some curves to look at uh, production of measles quanta, infectious quanta, uh, assuming that the 
last index, uh, the secondary case was infected, we could generate how many quanta, knowing room air exchange uh, uh, rates, uh, three different rates uh, uh, shown here, um, that this patient must have been a super spreader, uh, a, a patient who puts tremendous amount of measles infectious particles in the air. And interestingly, when I had the paper reviewed, the, one of the reviewers, who I found out later was Alexander Langmuir, uh, recommended that I add to my discussion uh, a practical uh, recommendation that following the visit of a patient with an illness suspected of being measles, it would seem prudent, prudent to increase fresh air ventilation, perhaps by simply opening the doors or windows. And I really love that sort of very practical, pragmatic advice uh, uh, that that came uh, during uh, sort of my training. Um, and then, as John mentioned, uh, I was intending to talk about the transformation of our medical school. I joined the faculty in 1997, started teaching uh, epidemiology as an elective, uh, and then it continued training medical students with the public health elective at the state health department. I worked with my colleagues then at the health department and encouraged the students to go there to work. And in fact, it included a 2003 graduate of our medical school, Rachel uh, Wiersba, and I was intrigued to see uh, that Rachel was on uh, in a press conference, John, with you yesterday and the governor. Uh, Rachel and I have just sort of reconnected, uh, and it's wonderful to see that a graduate from our program, actually before we were a school of medicine and public health, is now in a leadership position in the state of Colorado as the state epidemiologist. And uh, uh, so uh, it, it turns out that this process of changing our name from the University of Wisconsin Medical School to the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. I remind people, we're still a medical school. We are not a school of public health, but we're a medical school that, that uh, embraces the mission uh, and, and the uh, sort of the model of public health blended with our work in medicine. And in fact, I then was able to serve as the associate dean for a decade, uh, where we developed many programs from an MPH program to an institute to uh, a preventive medicine residency program uh, in this transformation. Uh, and I felt very lucky to be in that position. But after doing that for a decade, I wanted to sort of pause uh, administration is interesting, but it really isn't what gets me up in the morning. Uh, and uh, so I actually thought it was time for a change. So I gathered a small group of confidants, uh, respected colleagues for advice, and we went out for a bike ride. And I can't see John now, but I suspect, John, you're smiling, as Connie might be. Uh, this is a picture from April of 2018. And yes, summer comes early uh, in Wisconsin. We were out for a great bike ride to a small town south of Madison called Paoli. And actually, I was thinking about, at this time, uh, my retirement um, and uh, uh, to be able to do things uh, like this more often. Uh, so I actually retired in July of 2019. This is a picture of my wife on the Wisconsin River uh, at sunrise, uh, which is, uh, uh, if you come to Wisconsin, this is another adventure we'll have to take you on. Uh, and everything seemed good <clears throat> until uh, six months after retirement and uh, WHO declares a global emergency. And I've basically come out of retirement. I'm working uh, 40% at the university, but um, I should say I'm sort of getting paid 40%, but working pretty much back full time. And a lot of that is on uh, coronavirus. And so I would like to just briefly talk about the pandemic, but focus more on what I consider to be failures in our response. And let me just say, I'm not an expert on coronavirus. You, you have experts at the University of Colorado. John is certainly known nationally or internationally for his work. Uh, I, I'm more of a practitioner. I answer questions from friends and family and oftentimes from the media. Uh, but, but I think it's sort of that practical, uh, how do we answer these questions and, and move ahead uh, that I'd like to talk about uh, today. Clearly, um, it doesn't take an epidemiologist to know that the US uh, is uh, not doing well in our response to COVID, despite the potential for bias and reporting differences. We have 4% of the world's population, 20% of the deaths, and a disproportionate share of 
those deaths are poor and people of color. This is a picture of the mall with uh, a vigil for persons who have died from COVID. The maps are compelling. This one's from January showing the US leading the world in, uh, in uh, hotspots uh, for cases. Uh, and then in the US, uh, when we thought this would be sort of a pandemic or an epidemic that was limited to the Northwest and to the East Coast, it, it has raged uh, in every region, every state, every county across the US where there are susceptible populations gathering, which is basically nationwide, uh, we see uh, epidemics. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the disproportionate burden on racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, these are death rates per 100,000. Again, this is early as of July of last year, but these patterns have uh, persisted. The good news, and actually a year ago, I was not predicting a, that the pandemic would be as um, pervasive. Uh, I thought since we knew about lockdowns and shelter in place and we had quarantine and isolation along with social distancing, masking and high-end hygiene, we have our public health infrastructure, testing, tracking and tracing, and we have drugs that uh, certainly could be effective and the potential for vaccines. I thought we would control this pandemic, um, but <clears throat> I learned that the response to these strategies was not what I thought it might be. This is a picture of Jack and Wendy Torrance with their son Danny in The Shining. If you've not seen it, uh, I recommend, well, uh, be prepared uh, and uh, for a scary movie. Uh, and this, this uh, is a great picture of Jack Nicholson um, and captures really the essence of, of that movie. And uh, the caption, a couple of weeks of isolation with the family, what could go wrong? In preparing this talk, I came across a paper by Holtgrave from a decade ago, published in the Journal of Public Health Management and Practice, that talked about public health errors. And in that paper, he defined a public health error as occurring when one or more stakeholders in a public health system commits a cognizant, negligent act of commission or omission that fails to achieve necessary public health outcomes. I love the fact that he, he actually wanted to define uh, what an error in public health or health policy might be. And interestingly, when he did a Google search uh, in 2009, sorry, PubMed search uh, for the terms errors, mistakes, or omissions, notice what he found. Uh, plenty of mentions in with medical in the clinical setting, but none in public health, two mistakes in policy. And it was this concept that made me think that maybe in public health, we take a different view on our decisions, that to err is human, transform the healthcare system to think about medical errors and, and safety, and obviously to do the research on their source and, and prevention. Uh, but we in public health, um, don't seem to take that same approach when thinking about uh, errors, mistakes, or omissions. And obviously, there have been political failures. This is a commentary in Nature, uh, looking at four uh, uh, errors. Uh, um, scientists were si sidelined, silenced, and ignored. Uh, from cruise ships to asymptomatic spread, expert advice was ignored. The MMWR publication was uh, reviewed, often uh, changed and delayed, and COVID treatments uh, were prematurely approved. And in fact, the Lancet Commission uh, was, uh, has been quite critical. They compared the average death rate in the G7 countries to the death rate in the US, and again, acknowledged that the, there's limitations to this study. But a, they estimate broadly that about 40% of US COVID-19 deaths could have been prevented if we had done uh, what was done in, in these other countries. Now, the political failures at the national level are being repeated state in states and locally. In our own state, uh, our governor issued a uh, stay at home order uh, and very quickly was sued by uh, our uh, legislature. That suit was taken to the Supreme Court and in a highly partisan decision uh, was uh, struck down. Uh, since that time, his mask mandates 
Um, uh, uh, the statute allows him to give 60 days of, a, of an order. Um, after 60 days, the uh, legislature uh, enacts a law to overturn that. Uh, and then the governor simply reissues another 60 day mandate. So we are uh, fighting this political fight um, regarding um, uh, public health uh, measures. So I think the political mistakes and failures are well known and pretty obvious, but let me just run through these sort of six areas. I call them sort of systems failures, but you can think about communication systems, uh, public health systems, healthcare, social media as a system, uh, occupational systems, and the broad societal system. Um, well, our communication systems uh, have obviously failed. Our early focus on hand washing uh, and then the mixed messages on masks from leaders during the pandemic uh, caused confusion for many. And I think this is really rooted in our failure to adopt harm reduction strategies. The idea that perfection was needed, that everybody needed an N95 mask because that's the perfect approach and that Average people using a mask would touch it. They might have contaminated hands. Again, the, the focus on hand hygiene uh, and, and people didn't need masks or certainly wouldn't wanna take that supply away. No mention of something that might be good, though not perfect, like a cloth mask. And this communication failure, I, I think was tremendously influential. In fact, I think we may look back and think about this failure in communication um, as being sort of the root of many other uh, communication uh, challenges. Our public health systems have been uh, very much challenged. This is a report by uh, Trust for America's Health, um, talks about the well-known fact that less than 3% of our health funding is on public health, but maybe not as well known that this level has been declining in the last almost 20 years from three to two and a half percent and that public health emergency funding was cut by a third. This translates to about 50,000 state and local health department jobs being cut. That's reducing the frontline workforce by 20%. Shown here, uh, the, the graph in the uh, CDC allocation of uh, funding for state and local preparedness. So again, this is with a backdrop of uh, global preparedness and pandemic response. I also think we've had a failure of federal state relations, and the very few people recognize that this is part of the fabric of our uh, country, that uh, our constitution, our forefathers, uh, did not want the federal government involved in people's lives. Uh, and in fact, within three years of enacting uh, 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 of the Constitutional Congress, they decided to get together and uh, through the Bill of Rights, make it explicit that uh, the powers not delegated to the US are reserved for the states. This was implied in the original constitution, but they were so worried about federal overreach uh, that, they, uh, that this was the, the 10th amendment in the Bill of Rights. And on the right, you can see uh, our governor in the middle, Tony Evers, uh, and other governors sort of challenging this issue of who's in charge. How do we relate to the federal government? What's the role of CDC, the president, um, uh, and, and the complicated role of federal agency regulation for interstate commerce, uh, for example, uh, and for protection of the borders uh, versus the state's predominance in public health orders. And you, if you follow the media, you will just uh, you, you appreciate the complexity and really the chaos that has resulted uh, from this uh, debate. And one could say, looking back, that perhaps we did not design our country uh, uh, thinking about response to a global pandemic when we decided on such a, such a decentralized uh, state and local health department system. And other countries, which I'll look at, that have more centralized public health systems have responded in a, in a much better way. The other failure is I think of the healthcare system. Our employer-based health insurance system still has about 30 million people, despite the Affordable Care Act uh, uh, insuring more people. We have about 30 million people continue to be uninsured and many more are underinsured. So what happened with COVID was a surge in unemployment, more than 20 million workers, 
and many of them lost their employer sponsor insured when you insurance when you tie insurance to employer based systems a pandemic comes leads to unemployment it leads to un, uh, lack of insurance our fee for service market based system it, it's focused on incentives and raising prices pushing up volumes poor compensation of services for primary care and behavior health, and an undersupply of services in poor and rural communities. We know this about our fee-for-service market-based healthcare system. But what happens with COVID is a crippling financial loss that then threatens the viability of hospitals and office practices, both on the care side for COVID, but also the loss of revenue from uh, medical interventions that aren't being done. And finally, the racial and ethnic disparities that have been embedded in our healthcare system. We disproportionately fail to insure persons of color. We have a, a lack of coverage leads to a lack of access to care, higher prevalence of and less well controlled chronic illnesses among persons of color. And of course, during a COVID uh, a pandemic, persons of color are at higher risk than for serious illness, more likely to get care in those safety net hospitals and facilities that, over, that are overwhelmed by surges in demands for acute care. So these are fundamental design aspects of our healthcare system that fail uh, during pandemic response. I think we've also seen a failure of our social media systems. These platforms, if you have not yet seen The Social Dilemma, it streams on Netflix, uh, you highly recommend it. You should really watch this. It's pretty depressing, I must admit, because it doesn't end with many recommendations or solutions, uh, but it, it, it's must see TV in my opinion. And it talks about um, how the social media uh, industry is really not selling you uh, uh, an app, uh, they are getting your information. And these platforms then choose what you see based on your data history. And as a result, things like fake news spread much more rapidly than the truth. And every time you click a, 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 a link or you post a like, you're providing information to the tech companies that enhance, uh, entice you to buy their products or buy their ideas. And those are the ideas that have been propagated. Um, the uh, misinformation and the conspiracy theories about COVID have uh, the industry has learned that those are more likely to lead to more uh, clicks, and therefore uh, there, the industry is moving people toward, towards that misinformation. I just had Adobe remind me that Flash is ending, and I don't really care, so excuse me. I thought it was long gone. Um, so let's see if I can get back here. There we go. <clears throat> and uh, here's an analysis by Reuters and the University of Oxford looking at uh, 200 or so uh, pieces of misinformation. It turns out it comes from all sources. It's either uh, based on fact and reconfigured, put in false context, the content is manipulated or just made up. Um, or occasionally it's satire and parody which people misinterpret as information. So again, not all fake news is completely fabricate, fabricated. Uh, some is reconfigured, re reconfigured based on fact. And talking about social media, if you should ever take the temptation to go down the rabbit holes of comments following credible sources of media, this is just two comments that I just picked out randomly from a news story that I was involved in. Uh, my holistic doctors tell me I don't need to wear a mask. You've got your science, I've got mine. Who says who's right? Heaven help us all, we're sliding back to the dark ages. And take a vape pen and blow through the mask. Watch High Wire, two hour episode each Thursday. You have a 0.26% chance of dying, greater risk walking down the street. Take BioZinc at Amazon. If your immune system works, then it's not any worse than the flu. This is the material that is circulating um, to people who, uh, so, sort of who can least afford uh, to be reading it. And then failure of occupational system. The graph on the right shows before COVID that a total hours worked in a week from 30 to 35 hours. 
people with more education are working on average a bit more. Uh, and most of that work is in dark blue is in the workplace. Watch what happened uh, just already by late March. Uh, those with higher education cut their hours just a few, uh, but shifted tremendously to home office work. Whereas those with less education had a much more dramatic uh, cut in hours and but were not able to shift to home office work. So this is a greater impact on uh, uh, being able to work less and make less and not being able to work at home to, to, to self quarantine and to stay safe. So this is a structure of our occupational systems, which leads to higher risk for people with less education, more, more uh, in the service industry. And then my final uh, slide talks about uh, sort of societal systems in general. This is a slide that uh, I've used in teaching, uh, which is sort of diffusion of innovation. And in that as an innovation comes up in society or in healthcare, um, you have innovators, early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and uh, what they call laggards. I don't like that term. Um, but, but it implies that these are people late to technology. And as this diffusion happens, uh, we get to 100% of market share. Well, I think actually, when you think about um, innovation that happens with respect to COVID, um, uh, it, it affects people based uh, on education and on wealth and certainly race and ethnicity. Uh, and over time, what we've discovered is that uh, certain parts of the population never benefit from this uh, advance. And so we don't reach 100% of market share. Uh, we reach a much lower proportion of market share. So I, again, I think that's the previous graphic is sort of naive in thinking that everybody eventually benefits from a technology. In fact, part of society never does. So in summary, uh, I think our systems uh, function as they're designed. That's pretty clear. These are not failures of systems to perform as designed, it's failures of their design and, 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 and their functioning in that way. They were clearly not designed to confront a global pandemic from how we organize public health to how we organize healthcare. And certainly if you think about our communication systems, um, these were not designed to communicate information clearly, to provide care uh, uh, where people need it, and to uh, have an integrated response through uh, governmental public health systems. But I think also there's really been a limited discussion and analysis of the root causes of these failures. So I, I will come back to this at the end, because I think that's one area for people to begin to not, not just uh, talk about, but to begin to investigate and, uh, and, and study, better understand. The final area I wanted to talk about with respect to failure is uh, our, in a way failure of our culture. And that deals with the freedom and individualism versus collectivism and how it's impacted uh, mask orders or compliance with public health recommendation. This uh, study uh, in public health looked at, uh, tried to answer the question, why does COVID-19 uh, uh, rates, mortality rates, um, uh, this is uh, COVID-19 death rates per million on the y-axis, and then a measure of individualism from uh, collectivist societies at, on the left uh, to very individual, uh, individualistic societies on the right. And you can see the US uh, leads the world in this measure of individualism, uh, Great Britain, Austria. And then down here, you have uh, um, uh, Colombia, Korea, uh, Chile, Mexico, uh, Turkey, uh, more collectivist, uh, uh, less individualistic societies. And obviously, the investigators understand that demographics drive variation. They looked at age, for example. Um, chronic conditions. Uh, they also understand that public health response, the use of quarantine, for example. But uh, their hypothesis, and this is an intriguing hypothesis, is that these cultural differences between individualistic versus collectivistic uh, societies may have an impact on the incidence and mortality rates. And we clearly see this in our state. Uh, here's a, a, a protest that was held in August um, uh, downtown Madison, 
um, uh, about the mask mandate. My rights are essential. If you are scared, then I don't know what it says, but something probably not very complimentary um, to our public health department. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, there's a, a, vi a YouTube video that's linked there if you'd like to watch it later. Uh, I also understand that this is not unique to Wisconsin. I searched uh, uh, for Colorado and you've had the same debates. In fact, I imagine this debate is being had uh, across uh, every community uh, in the nation. Um, this, uh, the, the conflict between compromising individual rights uh, for the collective good. Why is though the mask sort of the centerpiece of this debate? And uh, I think there are a couple of aspects of the mask. First of all, it's a visible sign. If you get a vaccine, uh, you might have a sticker that says I've been vaccinated, but most people vaccinated or unvaccinated don't show that, don't have a, 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 a sign that they wear uh, saying that I refuse to get vaccinated. The mask is a very visible system, uh, a symbol. Um, also, the not wearing the masks shows this independence of strength and willing to take risk, not afraid or not being controlled. And it may result from this messaging that I talked about, the effects of the effectiveness of masks and the effects of wearing masks. And this gets back to this confusion about protecting self versus others. And I think the use of masks to protect others has not been clearly communicated. Many of the people that argue about uh, freedom and, and, uh, and liberty uh, quote John Stuart Mill, um, but, but actually when you do quote John Stuart Mill, he makes the important point that doing as we like subject to consequences as may follow without impediment from our fellow creatures, as long as what we do does not harm them. So that's an important caveat for individual freedom and liberty, that you can do what you do uh, as long as it doesn't harm me. In other words, your right to swing your arms about ends just where my nose begins. And this concept, I think, with the mask has not been clearly communicated. Most people who push back are pushing back because of the feeling that uh, they need the mask for, to protect themselves and not to protect others. There have also been notable opposition to public health orders. Um, some, uh, and I, we are preventive medicine residents have been working with students and, uh, and we know that what there's a sort of silent refusal, which is just not answering your phone when a call comes to, to in response to a positive test to quarantine or isolate to actually open refusal. Here in Kentucky, they refused to sign a, a self isolation order and they were put on house arrest. Um, and uh, uh, to have to go to the use of law uh, to enforce um, public health orders is, is pretty dramatic. So uh, in summary, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has re revealed significant failures in our public health, political and health systems. Um, <clears throat> and by their nature, public health control measures often conflict with personal freedom and certain political views. The vaccine is clearly gonna be effective, already is, uh, being effective in the short term. But I think in the long run, we need to address these systemic disparities in society and improve our system's capacity to respond before the next pandemic arrives. Um, so how do we respond collectively? Well, I think first and foremost, we should learn from our mistakes through failure analysis. What went wrong? What could or should have been done to prevent this problem from occurring in the first place? And to uh, use an example of this. When I started teaching now many years ago, I used this example. In fact, it was 1997. Uh, flight 800 had just crashed, TWA Flight 800, um, and uh, into the Atlantic Ocean off of Long Island, New York, and all 230 people on board were killed. And the government's investigation into this was unprecedented. Uh, massive amounts of research on uh, use, looking at the data with respect to trajectory and weather and whether there was uh, a, 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 um, perhaps a bomb that, that had been responsible. Um, again, this, this investigation uh, used a tremendous amount of data. It lasted more than four years before it was published. 
Uh, and during the investigation, uh, the National Traffic Safety Board issued 15 safety recommendations. And in fact, uh, Congress passed the Aviation Disaster Family Assistance Act. So it's an example of the tragedy of 230 people dying and a failure analysis that leaves no stone unturned um, and results in significant changes in rules and regulations and laws. So I, I think this sort of failure analysis to acknowledge the failures of public health and to better understand them uh, in a very systematic way would help us respond to the to pandemics in the future. And uh, let me close by saying, I think it's also that important that we respond individually. Uh, first, each of us can serve as a trusted source of information. We all are asked about uh, information related to COVID-19, and I think it's critically important that we all serve that role. We also should advocate for more funding for public health. I can't emphasize enough, my colleagues at the State Health Department are amazing in the, in the quality and the amount of work they're doing, but uh, they are under-resourced and, and overworked. We don't have sufficient public health funding to, to uh, address the pandemic and at the same time address core public health issues. And I also think it's, this is a political issue. Uh, we should support politicians who use evidence to support public health policies uh, rather than um, uh, supporting information uh, that is not evidence-based. And so uh, leaving some time, I did wanna come back and give an update on my retirement. Uh, I have, uh, this is a picture of my family uh, from uh, last uh, July at our cottage in Northern Wisconsin. These are, uh, uh, Kate, Kate is sitting next to me with each with a grandchild on our lap. These are our four kids and, and partners. Uh, my daughter in the lower right-hand corner was not able to join us. So uh, she's been Photoshopped in. Uh, and just uh, truth be told, I, I, I missed the fact that she wasn't there. And so I had to recall all my Christmas pictures and uh, reissue one with her Photoshopped in. I feel quite bad about that. Uh, but I will also be spending more time in Colorado. This is my son, Frederick. Uh, with his uh, son Ronan and uh, our daughter uh, Beth. Uh, uh, Rick lives in Denver and uh, uh, Beth lives in Frisco in her fifth year working at Copper Mountain in, in the ski industry. So with that, I will stop sharing. And I see John. Great, so thanks so much, Pat. I mean, that was sweeping in its coverage of uh, an awful lot of things. And I, what I would ask um, <clears throat> those of you who have been um, listening to put your um, comments, uh, questions uh, in the pad. Um, I could start with about 20, but I'll try and start with just um, one. And, and that is, you know, what, what is the mechanism for failure analysis? In other words, you talked about, we need to do a failure analysis and understand uh, where things broke down. Um, there's an awful lot of we's. And yeah. I guess the question is, you know, what what will we, what do we do in practice that could make a difference? I mean, much is going to be written. There's going to be books and reports, you know, about this. But how, how do we sort of collectively get all this together? Well, I, again, I uh, as I mentioned, you know, before uh, uh, the talk started, uh, in preparing this talk, I thought uh, I was not aware of this paper, sort of looking at the whole field of failure analysis in public health and health policy. And, and of course, having a colleague like Dave Kindig and working in sort of quality improvement, uh, uh, the landmark sort of uh, to err is human, uh, the healthcare system finally came to grips with the fact that they make mistakes, uh, that there are errors in medicine and people are killed as a result. And I think in public health, uh, we need to do more of that. So I think first thing is just to recognize it and uh, and acknowledge it. And then harder question is how do you sort of take the FAA model and the NTSB model uh, and uh, follow the failure analysis with root cause analysis, and then come back and say, well, these are the these are the systems that uh, the systems improvements that need to be made. Uh, maybe you. Uh, isolate uh, uh, publications like the MMWR from political influence. Maybe you, uh, you know, have an oversight board that uh, in insulates information. Um, so, so I think there are, I mean, I think the first approach is to recognize you have a problem. 
and to, and to talk about it more. And then follow that with uh, maybe some low hanging fruit where, um, you know, analysis of the communication failures uh, and why that happened. I, I think again, in, in, in the US, we, we want perfection and uh, perfection becomes the enemy of the good. We wanted everybody to have an N95 mask. And then someone said, well, how about a cloth mask? And that was debated for months. And then somebody said, you know, it's better than nothing. And it's like, oh, of course. I guess that's kind of going to, that's harm reduction. We're not, we don't really, we're not comfortable with harm reduction because it's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. And it actually turns out to be the best then. So when you make your next visit, we'll look at what's happened in the interim around where we've gone with reports and failure analysis. Here's a question from someone that fits right in. This is about uh, White House intervention and revisions of draft CDC guidance. Uh, this has come up quite recently. And it was mentioned, I think, on the uh, a recent report um, on uh, sort of reversing some of these things from the prior administration. So the question is about that. And then um, sort of ending with the question, do you believe this? And that's these various changes uh, and other interference at CDC should have triggered resignations at CDC. So I guess uh, I comment on both the interference and then how how does CD, CDC itself handle uh, this at the professional level? Yeah, it's easy to recommend that somebody quit when you're not that person. I mean, I think so. So uh, that and I understand that that whole issue because I have connections at CDC. I serve on the MMWR editorial board and. Uh, and the, uh, I did the Community Preventive Services Task Force. And so those were very serious um, considerations. Uh, I have been searching the CDC website and I am concerned uh, based on this report the last couple of days, I've noticed the last year that the information there uh, is not what it used to be. It is harder to find data clearly demonstrating health disparities in chronic disease. That used to be very apparent, and now it is in text form, for example. Uh, it's a very subtle change, uh, but I'm worried that what happened over the last four years was basically a, uh, you know, a uh, um, whitewashing, in effect, of the information available at CDC. And, and I'm encouraged that they are addressing this and uh, improving the, the information. And, and again, just to get back to the issue of um, you know, uh, resignations, I think it's very hard to work in. I worked in uh, the state for uh, nine years and um, you, I think it's better to have people in an institution trying to do the best they can than everybody quitting. So, but you know, that, that's for everybody's, you know, okay. to decide. So here's a question from Carol Runyon, who you uh, may uh, know, and uh, I'll read it as you, in addition to failure analysis, you look to the future, say next five years, how do you think public health broadening and CDC and health departments specifically can recover from the decline in <laughs> credibility funding the departure of many leaders um, as an outgrowth of uh, hostility about the collective public health action? Well, oh, that's a nice, easy question. Um, I have a, a close friend and colleague, uh, John Franco Pizzino, who's a health officer in Kansas, uh, and he resigned. Uh, I know many people who have been um, attacked, both um, you know publicly and privately uh, threatened. Um, so that's been really hard. I, I, I think, though, for that small vocal audience, there's a larger audience that now appreciates the work of public health. And how do you I mean, I don't know the answer to that. How do you sort of mute uh, the, the extremist view uh, and build on the general consensus that public health now, people know what public health is more than before. People understand epidemiology. Um, you know, there are people who are talking about rates and incidence rates and case fatality rates that didn't know what it was before. So I think, I think we've moved the needle in the right direction, but we haven't changed that extremist view. And I. I just think that's going to be a, a great challenge. Um, you know, I, uh, the other thing is, if if you're a young person thinking about a career in public health, uh, I would absolutely jump at it. I, I think there's no more exciting and important place to be. 
we need younger leadership um, and uh, it, it, it's a great opportunity. Hopefully the funding will follow so that it's not just sort of pandemic response and then falls off as we've done in the past. Okay, and here's a question from uh, Julie Mullica, a, a DRPH student. Uh, one of the thing I think, things I think needs to be reviewed is how local public health departments and the governor's office could have coordinated um, better. And certainly you can comment on this in general in Colorado, we have you know local uh, control, but uh, some things of course coordinated by or govern governor level uh, public health orders coming out. And the question is really about that tension, uh, which I think has been there uh, in different ways over time and likely perhaps in Wisconsin or other states as well. Yeah, we're local control. Uh, we have uh, you know health departments that are almost all county based. Uh, it's been challenging. I think though in Wisconsin, just speaking for our health departments, uh, we've generally had uh, positive relationships. Um, I, I think there's been good communication. Again, as you point out, this is a partnership. Uh, we have local control. That's where services are delivered. Um, but but I think it's worked as well as it as it's designed. I, I you know again for pandemic response, you wouldn't design a system of fifty state health departments, each each of which has to uh, administer its own program, do its own surveillance, uh, develop its own rules and laws. Um, this would be a, a, other countries have shown that this is an opportunity for strong central response. Um, that's just not how we built our government, and and I think. I think just good communication and good partnership. Uh, and, and I think that's happening with CDC now. Uh, I think it wasn't able to be as, um, as, a, uh, as good a partnership in the previous administration. So I, again, good communication. And it can't just happen with, when the pandemic starts. It has to be built on a strong foundation of good communication. Here's a question from Elijah. How can we best target our efforts as individuals? to drive public health policy alongside failure analysis in order to uh, implement widespread systemic changes? Well, that's why I sort of added that last slide because what can we do individually? Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, I do spend a lot of time individually talking about the evidence. Uh, now it's redirected. Notice I didn't talk much about vaccines. Uh, I look sort of look back at failures. Uh, I think we're gonna look back and see a tremendous failure in, in our vaccine rollout. Uh, right now would be the time to sort of have a prevention strategy to talk about vaccines as being uh, safe and effective and compared to illness, a, a much uh, better choice. Tom Frieden had a great interview uh, during a focus group with uh, Trump supporters who were largely anti-vaccine or vaccine hesitant, see, hesitant. and uh, it's a great interview on, on what worked in his use of science and evidence and using credible experts like physicians who agree to get vaccinated. So I, I think it's partly uh, focusing on evidence uh, and engaging and, and engaging people. And of course, being active in the policy process, uh, legislative process and, and political process. So here's a question from uh, Lisa Miller, faculty member and actually formerly uh, held the position that Rachel Hurley he holds um, now. And uh, common question, hot washes are done a lot in public health after events, but often don't get published. Question, is there a lesson for us as a school as a result of COVID? Uh, what should we be focused on? Uh, so did it, was that whitewashes? Hot washes. What's a hot wash? Tell me. Uh, so is that uh, like a- Speak up and give your explanation, a thorough investigation, uh, you know. Oh me. yeah, sure. Okay. Well, that's a good point. How do, uh, I, I think I worked for, again, for nine years at the state health department and we weren't encouraged to publish. Uh, you're so busy getting work done uh, that you don't have enough time to share lessons learned. And I think this is a, a great role for academic uh, public health partnerships for the academic health department, for example, to have colleagues who are sort of one foot in each camp that engage in scholarship and help our people who are at the front lines, busy solving public health problems and learning. So I, I think the extent to which you have involvement of people who are acti actually uh, practicing 
uh, public health? And then what can an academic partner provide? How, how can you help? So I, I think this is a, a good uh, model. Um, and uh, we found that to be helpful too. Also, I think learners, learners are excited about not just learning about public health, but also engaging in scholarship. So I found learners uh, to get learners involved and and to just put that information out in, uh, in, a, in a publication. And so Lisa offers her more articulate definition than me that uh, of hot wash um, failure analysis essentially of an event. So I think you know. Again, yes. Okay. Talking about. Thanks. Uh, there's a few more questions uh, coming along in our last few minutes. So here's a uh, comment about uh, masks uh, and their um, importance, and uh, talk about the. Um, comment, unfortunately, whether or not to wear masks has become a topic of debate, as you discussed. Should public health education be strengthened now is sort of the bottom line of the comment. Well, I, I, I tend to think that policies and systems approaches <clears throat> are important in that they, um, they, they don't differentially affect people with more education and more affluence. Um, so I, I think in this case, uh, policies at the local or state level are important parts of our educational uh, our, our armamentarian. That that if you that if you have a policy, um, it's really not going to be enforced as a law. It's really a, a, an educational tool. Um, the, again, the problem that we've had is this debate about what works and what doesn't work happens in the media, and the media just devour controversy. And, and so I think it's been really challenging. Um, I, I direct people back to credible sources. And, and I did see some good news about uh, fact checking and about credible sources. There was a lot of bad news when I was researching this talk, a lot of bad news about what's gone wrong. But there was some promising news about the role of fact checking and the role of credible sources and an uptick in CDC as a source of information. So that's the other thing I do is I just direct people back to credible sources. I avoid terms like, you know, I, I, I think or I believe, and I try and get back to research has shown or experts recommend, as opposed to using our own belief and you know, belief systems. So in a parallel question, uh, what about focusing on improving education about public health in K-12 and, and working towards greater scientific literacy overall? Well, that's the long road. I, I think that's not just uh, public health. I think that's, um, you know, when you look at the root causes of misinformation uh, and social media is we, our kids need to be better consumers of information, you, you are not going. We're not going to. We're not going to put this away. This is now with us for the rest of, uh, well, until they come up with something embedded in your, uh, you know, in your ear. Um, and so we need to educate young people uh, on uh, on how to be savvy consumers. And I think that's a challenge. I think it does go back to not not just uh, college and high school, but but elementary school. So I think a last question from Kelsey um, and very much resonates with your talk. How, how can we continue to keep public health funding a national and state level priority in the long term once COVID-19 is not dominating the public conversation? Well, that's a challenge. I, I think it is always, as you know, John, in public health, I think we are, uh, you, you never get a donation from somebody who's been, you know, whose life has been saved from prevention. And I just think that we need to, uh, almost like uh, sort of preparedness and bioterrorism. Uh, you don't want to instill fear in people so that they're, you know, uh, afraid all the time. But I think using the pandemic, um, we could bring in more partners. Business leaders have not traditionally been supportive of public health. They view us sort of as the enemy, the people who inspect and regulate. But I think once the pandemic subsides more, you come back to business leaders and say, we don't want this to happen again. We don't want to be closing down businesses and having mass unemployment. How can we be better prepared? Because this certainly, the, the extent to which this pandemic uh, uh, 
uh, predominant, you know, penetrated communities could have been prevented. So I think it's about bringing more people to the table and just getting better support for public health overall. Great. So um, we could continue talking for uh, a long time, I think, about all these issues, but we're at the end of our, uh, of our hour. I mean, I, Pat, I just wanted to uh, thank you on behalf of the school and everyone who uh, participated today for a really thought-provoking um, talk and summarizing what has been an extraordinary now year plus for uh, all of us in public health and of course all of us as uh, individuals. I mean I think you captured many things that um, are of importance uh, relevant to the school and hopefully things we're going to fix. So, yeah well Thanks, John. It's always a pleasure to, to see you. Uh, and again, I look forward to now being fully vaccinated. I, I trust that's increasing in Colorado as well, uh, that I look forward to the time when we can meet in person and gather uh, you know, on a bicycle, perhaps ride up that mountain behind you. Okay, we'll do that and uh, look forward to seeing you at the school as well. So thanks so much, Pat. Okay, thanks, John. See you later. Bye.